Okay, I'm going to start out by introducing a poem. It was one of my very favorite poems from high school. Back in my senior year, I had to take English literature and uh, the poem Ozymandias by Percy Bliss Shelley is something that stuck in my mind uh, throughout the rest of my life. Uh, it was written in 1818 and published that year, uh, kind of in response to the news that the British Museum was being delivered a huge statue of Ramses II of Egypt, one of the great and most powerful of the pharaohs, and that that statue in pieces had been discovered in the desert. And what prompted me to look the poem up again was the reading of the book I'm going to share with you today, a chapter of it, The World Without Us by Alan Weissman. And you'll see why momentarily. And when I, when I looked up the poem again, I discovered that there were two poems entitled Ozymandias, one by Percy Bliss Shelley that I read in high school, and I suspect many of you did as well, and one by his very close friend, Horace Smith. They had decided to do a kind of a competition to see who could get their poem published musing about the import of the discovery of this magnificent statue. So here is Percy Bliss Shelley's version. I will save Horace Smith's until after the reading. I met a traveler from an antique land who said, two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert, near them on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read, which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things. The hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal, these words appear. My name is, on the Mandi is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. And what Alan Weisman wants us to imagine is a world in which humans have disappeared. And he starts out giving us some reason to think that that's not entirely an impossible scenario. He says, I want you to picture a world from which we all suddenly vanish. Tomorrow. Unlikely, perhaps, but for the sake of argument, not impossible. And get this very first scenario. Say, a homo sapiens specific virus, natural or diabolically nano-engineered, picks us off, but leaves everything else intact. Or some misanthropic evil wizard somehow targets that unique 3.9% of our DNA that makes us human beings and not chimpanzees. Or perfects a way to sterilize our sperm. Or say that Jesus, more of him later, or space aliens rapture us away, either to our heavenly glory or to a zoo somewhere across the galaxy. Look around you at today's world. Your house, your city, the surrounding land, 
the pavement underneath and the soil hidden below that. Leave it all in place, but extract the human beings. Wipe us out. See what's left. How would the rest of nature respond if it were suddenly relieved of the relentless pressures that we heap on it and our fellow organisms? How soon would or could the climate return to where it was before we fired up all our machines? How long would it take to recover lost ground and restore Eden to the way it must have gleamed and smelled the day before Adam? or homo habilis, appeared. Could nature ever obliterate all the traces? How would it undo our monumental cities and public works and reduce our myriad plastics and toxic synthetics back to benign basic elements? Or are some so unnatural that they're indestructible? And what of our finest creations, our architecture, our art, our, man, our manifestations of spirit? Are any truly timeless, at least enough so to last until the sun expands and roasts our earth to a cinder? And even after that, might we have left some faint, enduring mark on the universe? some lasting glow or echo of the earthly humanity, some interplanetary sign that once we were here. And then I'm going to jump to chapter 3, the city without us. And the city he's going to talk about is New York City which many of us, even here, uh, have some direct connection with. And many of us who don't uh, have certainly been there. The awesomeness of New York City. The notion that someday nature could swallow whole something so colossal and concrete as a modern city doesn't slide easily into our imaginations. The sheer titanic presence of a New York City resists efforts to picture it wasting away. The events of September 2001 showed only what human beings with explosive hardware can do, not crude processes like erosion or rot. The breathtaking swift collapse of the World Trade Center towers suggested more to us about their attackers than about our moral, our mortal invul uh, vulnerabilities that could doom our entire infrastructure. And even that once inconceivable calamity was confined to just a few buildings. Nevertheless, the time it would take nature to rid itself of what urbanity has wrought may be less than we might suspect. In 1939, a World's Fair was held in New York City. For its exhibit, the government of Poland sent a statue of Władysław Jogło, the founder of Bloleszka Puszka. Now, I must confess that of all of the, of the burdens of human existence, Learning how to pronounce Polish might be one of the most onerous. Anyway, uh, Jugio uh, had not been immortalized for preserving the, uh, uh, the primeval forest, uh, uh, Bolcheska Pushka, uh, but instead, by marrying its queen, Jagiello had united Poland and his duchy of Lithuania into a European power. The sculpture portrays him on horseback, following his victory at the Battle of Grunwald in 1410. Triumphant, he hoists two swords captured from Poland's latest vanquished enemy, 
the Teutonic Knights of the Cross. <clears throat> in 1939, however, the Poles weren't faring well against some descendants of those Teutonic Knights. Before the New York World's Fair ended, Hitler's Nazis had taken Poland, and the sculpture could not be returned to its homeland. Six sad years later, the Polish government gave it to New York as a symbol of its courageous, battered survivors, and the statue of Jaguar now placed, is placed in Central Park, overlooking what today is called the Turtle Pond. Now, when Dr. Eric Sanderson leads a tour through the park, he and his flock usually pass the statue without pausing because they're lost in another century, the 17th. At its Bronx Zoo headquarters, Sanderson directs the Manhattan Project, the Manhattan Project, an attempt to recreate virtually Manhattan Island as it was when Henry Hudson's crew first saw it in 1609, a pre-urban vision that tempts speculation about how a post-human future might look. When Sanderson wanders through Central Park, he's able to look beyond the half million cubic yards of soil hauled in by its designers, Frederick Law Olmsted and Calvert Vox, to fill in what was mostly a swampy bog surrounded by poison oak and sumac. He can trace the shoreline of the long, narrow lake that lay along what is now 59th Street, north of the Plaza Hotel, with its tidal outlet that meandered through the salt marsh to the East River. From the west, he can see a pair of streams entering the lake that drain the slope of Manhattan's major ridgeline, a deer and mountain lion trail known today as Broadway. Eric Sanderson sees water flowing everywhere in town, much of it bubbling from underground, which is how Spring Street got its name. He's identified more than 40 brooks and streams that traveled what was once a hilly, rocky island in the Algonquin tongue of its first human occupants, the Lenni Lenape, Manahara referred to those now vanished hills. When New York's 19th century planners imposed a grid on everything north of Greenwich Village, the jumble of original streets to the south being impossible to unsnarl, they behaved as if topography were irrelevant except for some massive, unmovable schist outcrops in Central Park and at the island's northern tip. Manhattan's textured terrain was squashed and dumped into stream beds and then planed and leveled to receive the advancing city. Later, new contours arose, this time routed through rectilinear forms and hard angles, much as the water that once sculpted the island's land was now forced underground through a lattice of pipes. Eric Sanderson's Manahatta Project has plotted how closely the modern sewer system flows near the old water courses, although man-made sewer lines can't wick away runoff as efficiently as nature. In a city that buried its rivers, he observes, rain still falls. It has to go somewhere. As it happens, that will be the key to breaching Manhattan's hard shell if nature sets about dismantling it. It would begin very quickly with the first strike at the city's most vulnerable spot, its underbelly. New York City's transits, Paul Schuber and Peter Briffa, understand perfectly how this would work. Every day, they must keep 13 million gallons of water from overpowering New York subway tunnels. Well, that's just the water that's already underground, notes Schuber. 
When it rains, the amount is, Riffa shows his palms surrendering. It's incalculable. Well, maybe not actually incalculable, but it doesn't rain any less now than before the city was built. Once, Manhattan was 27 square miles of porous ground interlaced with living roots that siphoned the 47.2 inches of average annual rainfall up trees and into meadow grasses, which drank their fill and exhaled the rest into the atmosphere. Whatever the roots didn't take settled into the, uh, into the island's water table. In places, it surfaced in lakes and marshes, with the excess draining off to the ocean via the 40 streams, which now lie trapped beneath concrete and asphalt. Today, because there's little soil to observe rainfall or vegetation to transpire it, and because buildings block sunlight from, from, from evaporating it, rain collects in puddles or follows gravity down sewers. <coughs> or it flows into subway vents, adding to the water already down there. Below 131st Street and Lenox Avenue, for example, a rising underground river is corroding the bottom of the A, B, C, and D subway lines. Constantly, men in reflective vests and denim roughouts, like Schubers and Briffas, are clamoring down beneath the city to deal with the fact that under New York, groundwater is always rising. Whenever it rains hard, sewers clog with storm debris. The number of plastic bags adrift in the world's cities may truly exceed calculation, and the water needing to go somewhere plops down the nearest subway stairs. Add a nor'easter, and the surging Atlantic Ocean bangs against New York's water table, until in places like Water Street in Lower Manhattan, or Yankee Stadium in the Bronx, it backs right up into the tunnels, shutting everything down until it subsides. Should the ocean continue to warm and rise even faster than the current inch per decade, at some point, it simply won't subside. Schuber and Briffa have no idea what might happen next. <clears throat> Add to all that the 1930s vintage water mains that frequently burst, and the only thing that has kept New York from flooding already is the incessant vigilance of its subway crews and 700 and 53 pumps. Think about those pumps. New York's subway system, an engineering marvel in 1903, was laid underneath <clears throat> an already existing, burgeoning city. As that city already had sewer lines, the only place for the subway to go was below them. So, explained Schuber, we have to pump uphill. In this, New York is not alone. Cities like London, Moscow, and Washington built their subways far deeper, often to double as bomb shelters, and therein lies much potential danger. <clears throat> Shading his eyes with his white hard hat, Schuber appears down into a square pit beneath the Van Sicklin Avenue station in Brooklyn where each minute 650 gallons of natural groundwater gushed from the bedrock. Gesturing over the roaring cascade, he indicates four, four submersible cast iron pumps that take turns laboring against gravity to stay ahead. Such pumps run on electricity. When the power fails, things can get difficult very fast. Following the World Trade Center attack, an emergency pump train bearing a jumbo portable diesel generated pumped out 27 times the volume of Shea Stadium. Had the Hudson River actually burst through the path train's tunnels that connect New Jersey's subways to uh, New, York, New York's to New Jersey, 
as was greatly feared, the pump train and possibly much of the city would simply have been overwhelmed. In an abandoned city, there would be no one like Paul Schuber or Peter Briffa to race from station to station, station to flooded station, whenever more than two inches of rain falls, as happens lately with disturbing frequency, sometimes snaking hoses up stairways to pump a sewer to a sewer down the street, sometimes navigating these tunnels in inflatable boats. But with no people there, there would also be no power. The pumps would go off and stay off. When this pump facility shuts down, says Suber, in half an hour, Water reaches a level where trains can't pass anymore. Griffa removes his safety goggles and rubs his eyes. A flood in one zone would push water into others, and within 36 hours, the whole subway system would fill. Even if it weren't raining, with subway pumps stilled, that would take no more than a couple days, they estimate. At that point, water would start sluicing away soil under the pavement, and before long, streets start to crater. With, one unclogging with no one unclogging sewers, some new water courses form on the surface. Others appear suddenly as waterlogged subway ceilings collapse. And within 20 years, the water-soaked steel columns that support the street above the east sides four, five, and six trains corrode and buckle as Lexington Avenue caves in, becomes a river. Well before then, however, pavement all over town would have already been in trouble. According to Dr. Ahmed, uh, Jamil Ahmed, chair of the Civil Engineering Department of New York's Cooper Union, things will begin to fall apart during the very first months of March, after the humans vacate. <clears throat> Each March, temperature normally flutters back and forth around 32 degrees, as many as 40 times. Presumably, climate change could push this back to February. Whenever it is, the repeated freezing and thawing make asphalt and cement split. When snow thaws, water seeps into fresh cracks. And when it freezes, the water expands, and the cracks widen. Call it water's retaliation for being squished under all that landscape. Almost every other compound in nature contracts when frozen. But H2O molecules do the opposite, organize themselves into elegant hexagonal crystals that take up about 9% more space than they did when sloshing around in liquid state. Pretty six-sided crystals suggest snowflakes so gossamer it's hard to conceive of them pushing apart slabs of sidewalk. It's even more difficult to imagine carbon steel water pipes built to withstand 7,500 pounds of pressure per square inch exploding when they freeze. That's exactly what happens. As pavements separate, weeds like mustard, shamrock, goosegrass blow in from Central Park and work their way down the new cracks which widen further. In the current world, before they get too far, city maintenance crews show up, kill the weeds, and fill the fissures. But in the post-people world, there's no one left continually to patch New York. The weeds are followed by the city's most prolific exotic species, the Chinese ailanthus tree. Even with eight million people around, ailanthus, otherwise innocently known as the tree of heaven, are implacable invaders, capable of rooting in tiny chinks in subway tunnels, unnoticed until their spreading leaf canopies start poking from sidewalk grates. With no one to yank their seedlings, within five years, powerful ailanthus roots are heaving up sidewalks and wreaking havoc with sewers which are already stressed by all the plastic bags and the old newspaper mush that no one's clearing away. 
As soil long trapped beneath the pavement gets exposed to sun and rain, other species jump in, and soon leaf litter adds to rising piles of debris clogging the sewer system. The early pioneer plants won't even have to wait for the pavement to fall apart. Starting from the mulch collecting in gutters, a layer of soil will start forming a top New York sterile hard shell, with, and the seedlings will sprout. With far less organic material available to it, just wind-blown dust and urban soot, precisely that has happened in an abandoned elevator bed, iron bed, of the New York Central Railroad on Manhattan's west side. Since the train stopped running there in 1980, the inevitable ailanthus trees have been joined by a thickening ground cover of onion grass and fuzzy lamb's ear, accented by strands of goldenrod. In some places, the track emerges from the second stories of warehouses that it once serviced into elevated lanes of wild crocuses and irises and evening primrose, asters, and Queen Anne's lace. So many New Yorkers glancing down from windows in Chelsea's art district were moved by the sight of this untended flowering green ribbon prophetically and swiftly laying claim to a dead slice of their city that it was dubbed the High Line and has been designated a park. <clears throat> In the first few years with no heat, pipes burst all over town. The freeze-thaw cycle moves indoors, and things start to seriously deteriorate. Buildings groan as their innards expand and contract. Joints between walls and roof lines separate, and where they do, Rain leaks in, bolts rust, and facing pops off, exposing insulation. If the city hasn't burned yet, it will now. Collectively, New York architecture isn't as combustible as, say, San Francisco's incendiary rows of clapboard Victorians. But with no firemen to answer the call, a single dry lightning strike that ignites a decade of dead branches and leaves piling up in Central Park will spread flames throughout the city. Within two decades, lightning rods have begun to rust and snap, and roof fires leap among buildings, entering paneled offices filled with paper fuel. Gas lines ignite with a rush of flames that blows out windows. Rain and snow blow in, and soon, even poured concrete floors are freezing, thawing, and starting to buckle. Burnt insulation and charred wood add nutrients to Manhattan's growing soil cap. Native Virginia creeper and poison ivy now claw at walls covered with lichens, which thrive in the absence of air pollution. Red-tailed hawks and peregrine falcons nest increasingly in increasingly skeletal high-rise structures. Within two centuries, estimates Brooklyn, estimates Brooklyn Botanical Garden Vice President Stephen Clements, colonizing trees will have substantially replaced pioneer weeds. Gutters buried under tons of leaf litter provide new fertile ground for native oaks and maples from the city park. Arriving black locust and arriving an autumn olive shrubs, shrubs fix nitrogen, allowing sunflowers, blue stem, and white uh, snake root to move in along with apple trees, their seeds expelled by proliferating, uh, proliferating birds. Biodiversity will increase even more predicts Cooper Union civil engineer Jamil Ahmad as buildings tumble and smash into each other and lime from crushed concrete raises soil pH, inviting in trees such as buckthorn and birch that need less acidic environments. Even buildings anchored into the hard Manhattan schist, the schist is the, the huge rock formations uh, around New York City, like most New York skyscrapers, 
weren't intended to have their steel foundations waterlogged. Plug sewers, deluged tunnels, and streets reverting to rivers will conspire to undermine sub-basements and destabilize their huge loads. In a future that pretends stronger and more frequent hurricanes, strutting the North, North America's Atlantic coast, ferocious winds will pummel tall and steady structures. Some will topple, knocking down others. Like a gap in the forest when a giant tree falls, new growth will rush in, and gradually, the asphalt jungle will give way to a real one. The New York Botanical Garden, located on 250 acres across from the Bronx Zoo, possesses the largest herbarium anywhere outside of Europe. Among its treasures are wildflower specimens gathered on Captain Cook's 1769 Pacific Wanderings, and a shred of moss from Tiago del Fuego with accompanying notes written in watery black ink and signed by its collector, C. Darwin. Most remarkable, though, is the Botanical Garden's 40-acre tract of original, old-growth, virgin New York forest, never logged, never cut, but mightily changed. Until only recently, it was known as the hemlock forest for its shady strands of that graceful conifer. But almost every hemlock here is now dead, slain by a Japanese insect smaller than the period at the end of this sentence, which arrived in New York in the mid-1980s. The oldest and biggest oaks dating back to when the forest was British, are also crashing down. Their vigor sapped by acid rain and heavy metals such as lead from automobile and factory fumes, which have soaked into the soil. It's unlikely they'll come back because most canopy trees here long ago stopped regenerating. Every resident native species now harbors its own pathogen, some fungus, insect, or disease that seizes the opportunity to ravish trees weakened by chemical onslaught. And if that weren't enough, as the Botanical Gardens forest became an island of greenery surrounded by hundreds of square miles of gray urbanity, it became the primary refuge for Bronx squirrels. With natural predators gone and no hunting permitted, there's nothing to stop them from devouring every acorn or hickory nut before it can germinate, which they do. The other invasion that has accosted natives, metals such as lead, mercury, and cadmium, will not wash quickly from the soil because these are literally heavy molecules. One thing is certain. When cars have stopped for good and factories go dark and stay that way, no more such metals will be deposited. For the first hundred years or so, however, corrosion will periodically set off time bombs left in petroleum tanks, chemical and power plants, and hundreds of dry cleaners. Gradually, bacteria will feed on the residues of fuel, laundry solvents, and lubricants reducing them to more benign organic hydrocarbons, although a whole spectrum of man-made novelties, ranging from certain pesticides to plasticizers to insulators, will linger for many millennia until microbes evolve that can process them. Yet with each new acid-free rainfall, trees, trees that, will, that still endure will have fewer contaminants to resist as chemicals are gradually flushed from the system. Over centuries, vegetation will take up decreasing levels of heavy metals and will recycle, deposit, and dilute them further. As plants die, decay, and lay down more soil cover, the industrial toxins will be buried deeper, and each succeeding crop of native seedlings will do better. 
And although many of New York's heirloom trees are endangered, if not actually dying, few, if any, are already extinct. Even the deeply mourned American chestnut, devastated everywhere after the fungal blight entered New York around 1900 in a shipment of Asian nursery plants, still hangs on in the New York Botanical Garden's old forest, literally by its roots. It sprouts up skinny shoots two feet high, gets knocked back by blight, and does it again. And one day, perhaps, with no human stresses sapping its vigor, a resistant strain will finally emerge. Once the tallest hardwood, hardwood in American eastern forests, the resurrected chestnut trees will have to coexist with robust non-natives that are probably here to stay. Japanese barberry, oriental bittersweet, and surely elanthus. The ecosystem here will be a human artifact that will persist in our absence, a cosmopolitan botanical mixture that would never have occurred without us. In the millennial year of 2000, a harbinger of a future that might revive the past appeared in the form of a coyote that managed to reach Central Park. Subsequently, two more made it into town, as well as a wild turkey. The rewilding of New York City may not wait until people leave. <clears throat> the first advanced coyote arrived <laughs> via the George Washington Bridge, which Jerry Del Tufo managed for the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. Later, he took over the bridges that link Staten Island to the mainland and Long Island. A structural engineer in his 40s, he considers bridges among the loveliest ideas human ever conceived, gracefully spanning chasms that bring people together. Del Tufo himself spans an ocean. His olive features bespeak Sicily, but his voice is pure urban New Jersey. Bred to the pavement and steel that became his life work, he nonetheless marvels at the annual miracle of baby peregrine falcons hatching high atop George Washington's towers, and at the sheer botanical audacity of grass, weeds, and ailanthus trees that defiantly bloom far from topsoil, from metal niches suspended high above the water. His bridges are under constant guerrilla assault by nature. Its arsenal and troops may seem ludicrously puny against steel-plated armor, but to ignore endless ubiquitous bird droppings that can snag a sprout of airborne seeds and simultaneously dissolve paint would be fatal. Del Tufo was up against a primitive but unrelenting foe for whose ultimate strength is its ability to outlast its adversary, and he accepts the fact that nature must win. On a February afternoon, he heads through snow flurries to, Bayonne, to the Bayonne Bridge, chatting with his crew over his radio. The underside of the approach on Staten Island side is a powerful steel matrix that converges in a huge concrete block anchored to bedrock, an abutment that bears half the load of Bayonne's main span and to stare up directly into its labyrinthine load-bearing eye beams and bracing members interlocked with half-inch steel plates, flanges, and several million half-inch rivets and bolts recalls the crushing awe that humbles pilgrims gaping at the soaring Vatican Dome of St. Peter's Cathedral, something this mighty must be here forever. Yet Jared Del Tuffo knows exactly how these bridges, without humans to defend them, will come down. It wouldn't happen immediately because the most immediate threat will disappear with us. 
It's not, says Del Tufo, the incessant pounding traffic. These bridges are so overbuilt, traffic is like an ant on an elephant. In the 1930s, with no computers to precisely calculate tolerances of construction materials, cautious engineers simply heaped on excess mass and redundancy. We're living off the overcapacity of our forefathers. The GW alone has enough galvanized steel wire in its three-inch main cables to wrap the earth four times, even if every other suspender rope deteriorated, the bridge wouldn't fall down. Enemy number one is the salt that highway departments spread on the roadways each winter, ravenous stuff that keeps eating steel once it's done with the ice. Oil, antifreeze, and snow melt dripping from cars wash salt in the catch basins and crevices where maintenance crews must find and flush it. With no more people, there won't be salt, but there will, however, be rust, and quite a bit of it, when no one is painting the bridges. At first, oxidation forms a coating on steel plate twice as thick or more than the metal, that, uh, more, or more as the, that, as the metal itself which slows the pace of the chemical attack. For steel to completely rust through and fall apart might take centuries, but it won't be necessary to wait that long for New York's bridges to start dropping. The reason is a metallic version of the freeze-thaw drama. Rather than crack like concrete, steel expands when it warms and it contracts when it cools, so that steel bridges can actually get longer in the summer. So they need expansion joints. In winter, when they shrink, the space inside the expansion joint joints opens wider, and stuff blows in. Wherever it does, there's less room for the bridge to expand when things warm up. With no one painting bridges, joints fill not only with debris, but also with rust, which swells to occupy far more space than the original metal. Come summer, says Del Tufo, the bridge is going to get bigger whether you like it or not. If the expansion joints clog, it expands toward the weakest link, like where two different materials connect. He points to where four lanes of steel meet a concrete abutment. There, for example, the concrete could crack when the beam is bolted to the pier. Or, after a few seasons, that bolt would shear off. Eventually, the beam would walk itself right off and fall. Every connection is vulnerable. Rust that forms between two steel plates bolted together exerts forces so extreme that either the plates bend or the rivets pop. Arc bridges, like the Bayonne or the Hell's Gate Bridge over the East River, made to hold railroads, are the most overbuilt of all. They might hold for the next thousand years, although earthquakes ripping through one of the several faults under the coastal plain could shorten that period. They would probably do better than the 14 steel line concrete subway tubes beneath the East River, one of which, leading to Brooklyn, dates back to horses and buggies. Should any of their sections separate, the Atlantic Ocean would rush in. The suspension and truss bridges that carry automobiles, however, will last only two or three centuries before their rivets and bolts fight, fail and entire sections fall into the waiting waters. Until then, more coyotes follow the footsteps and the intrepid ones that manage to reach Central Park. Deer, bear, Finally, wolves, which have re-entered New England from Canada, arrive in turn. By the time most of its bridges are gone, Manhattan's newer buildings have also all been ravaged, as whatever leaks reach their, in, their embedded steel reinforcing bars. They rust, expand, and burst the concrete that cheese them. Older stone buildings, such as the Grand Central, especially with no more acid rain to pock their marble, will outlast every shiny 
modern box. Ruins of high rises echo the love, the love songs of frogs breeding in Manhattan's reconstituted streams, now stocked with alewives and mussels dropped by seagulls. Herring and shad have returned to the Hudson, though they spent some generations adjusting to radioactivity trickling out of Indian Point nuclear power plant, 35 miles north of Times Square, after its reinforced concrete succumbed. Missing, however, are nearly all fauna adapted to us. They seeming, the, the seemingly invincible cockroach, a tropical import, long ago froze in unheated apartment buildings. And without garbage, rats starved or became lunch for the raptors nesting in burnt out skyscrapers. Rising waters, tides, and salt corrosion have replaced the engineered shoreline circling New York's five boroughs with estuaries and small beaches. With no dredging, Central Park's ponds and reservoirs have been reincarnated as marshes. With natural, <clears throat> with, without natural grazers, unless horses used by handsome cabs and by park police managed to go feral and breed, Central Park's grass is gone. <clears throat> A maturing forest is in its place, radiating down former streets and invading empty foundations. Coyotes, wolves, red foxes, bobcats have brought squirrels back into balance with oak trees, tough enough to outlast the lead that we deposited. And after 500 years, even a warming climate, even in a warming climate, beaches and moisture-loving species such as ash begin to dominate. Long before the wild predators finished off the last descendants of, pest, of pet dogs. But a wily population of feral house cats persists, feeding on starlings. With bridges finally down, tunnels flooded, and Manhattan truly an island again, moose and bear swim a widened Harlem River to feast on the berries that Lenape once picked. Amid the rubble of Manhattan's financial institutions that literally collapsed for good, a few bank vaults stand. <clears throat> the money within, however worthless, is mildewed but safe. Not so the artwork stored in museum vaults built for climate control. Without electricity, protection ceases. Eventually, museum roofs spring leaks, usually starting with their skylights and their basements filled with standing water, subjected to wild swings in humidity and temperature, everything in storage rooms is prey to mold, bacteria, and the voracious larvae of a notorious museum scourge, the black carpet beetle. As they spread to other floors, fungi discolor and dissolve paintings in the metropolitan beyond recognition. Unless something falls on them first, ceramics are doing fine, uh, and they, re they await reburial for the next archaeologist to dig them up. Corrosion has thickened the patina on bronze statues, but it hasn't affected their shapes. That's why we know about the Bronze Age, notes of Manhattan art conservator Barbara Applebaum. Even if the Statue of Liberty ends up at the bottom of the harbor, Applebaum says, its form will remain intact indefinitely, albeit somewhat chemically altered and possibly encased in barnacles. That might be the safest place for it because at some point, thousands of years hence, any stone wall still standing may be chunks of St. Paul's Chapel across from the site of the World Trade Center built in 1766 from Manhattan's own hard schist must finally fall. Three times in the past 100,000 years, glaciers have scraped New York clean. Unless humankind's Faustian affair with carbon fuel ends up tipping the atmosphere past the point of no return, and runaway global warming transfigures the Earth into Venus, at some unknown date, 
If that doesn't happen, glaciers will do their duty again. The mature beech, oak, ash, ailanthus forest will be mowed down. The four great mounds of entombed garbage at the fresh kill landfill on Staten Island will be flattened and their vast accumulation of stubborn PVC plastic and of one of the most durable human creations of all, glass, will be ground to powder. After the ice recedes, buried in the moraine, and eventually in geologic layers below, will be an unnatural concentration of a reddish metal, which briefly had assumed the form of wiring and plumbing. And then it was hauled to the dump and returned to the earth. And the next tool maker to arrive, or to evolve on this planet, might discover and use it, but by then there would be nothing to indicate that it was us who put it there. And with that, I would like to turn to the second Ozymandias poem. By the way, the, the real inscription on the statue of Ramses was recorded by a Greek, an ancient Greek historian, Diodorus Siculus, and it read, King of kings, Ozymandias am I, and if any want to know how great I am and where I lie, let him outdo me in my work. And you'll notice that in Shelley's poem, poem that inscription is paraphrased, as it will be in Horace Smith's. In Egypt's sandy silence, all alone stands a gigantic leg which far off throws the only shadow that the, dis that the desert knows. I am Ozymandias, saith the stone, the king of kings. This mighty city shows the wonders of my hand. That he is gone. Not but the leg remaining to disclose the sight of this forgotten Babylon. We wonder, and some hunter may express wonder like ours when through the wilderness where London stood, holding the wolf in chase. He meets some fragment huge, stops to guess what powerful but unrecorded race once dwelt in that annihilated place. Thank you for being here.